This is Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And today we're going to feature an exclusive interview with the one and only Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins has a new book called Books Do Furnish a Life, which we'll spend a lot of time talking about because it goes everywhere and that's where we want to go. Uh, Richard Dawkins professionally is an ethologist, an evolutionary biologist, an author, popularizer of his field in science in general and rational thinking all around. And so much of what he does is what we celebrate here on Star Talk. So we've got him. Richard, welcome back to Star Talk. This is not your first rodeo with us. It's such a pleasure, Neil. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was looking at your book. Oh my gosh. Richard, that dare I say, dare I even suggest that if anyone read only one book of yours, it should be this, because this to me reads like a cross section of everything you have cared about and expressed professionally and in the public with regard to what your life has been about. Is that a fair characterization of this? Well, it's collection? very interesting. I never thought of that before, Neil. Thank you. Um, it does span uh, much of my career ever since I started reviewing books, I suppose, and writing uh, forwards to books. So, yes, it, it's a good slice of my increasingly uh, alarmingly long career. <laughs> alarmingly long. <laughs> I, and I, you know, so I, I worried because people who start sort of collecting their life's works, it's almost like they're ready to die. And I don't want you dying anytime soon. So just <laughs> that, that, that's why I was worried when, uh oh, uh oh, let me check this heart rate. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me reassure you, Neil. I've, I've got two books, two other books coming out. Um, uh, one in November, and one not quite sure when. But anyway, the, the one in November, uh, I'm looking forward to very much. It's called Flights of Fancy, and it's about flight. Uh, and um, so I, I, I'm not checking out anytime soon. Okay, stay alive at least until your last book gets published. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm also I, I noted uh, as do many prolific authors. In the first section of the book called Front Matter, there's a list of all of your previous books. And I went down the list. And forgive me, Richard, I haven't read all 30 of them, <laughs> 15 oh, or I so. You. <laughs> no, but I've read like three and a half, okay? And I got the list. I've read The Selfish Gene. I've read The Blind Watchmaker. I've read The God Delusion. And I've read parts of other books. And I can say that every one of your books I've read, each one of the books of yours I've read, is a jewel. It's a jewel of writing. It's a jewel of science communication. It's a jewel of intellect. So I will extrapolate and declare that every one of these books is a jewel and it forms a crown of some kind, <laughs> some kind of bejeweled crown that is a gift to civilization of how you think and how you would welcome others to think to make a better world. How kind. What, what can I say? I mean, oh. <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd love to think that. <laughs> okay. So let's go straight into some of these topics. I very much embrace your organization of the book. Uh, there's sections, and each section sort of delves into a, uh, an area of, of science as it relates and as it is received by the public. And, and I'm honored, actually, to be mentioned in your first section, um, where you recount an interview that we had in my office at the Hayden Planetarium. We talked about science communication, and we were sort of trading notes, uh, is how I remember it, and to see, you know, what succeeded, what didn't. And what I want for you, if you, can you tell me, over your years, what have you learned to do differently? based on either the, tri the trial and error of your successes or failures, or did you find one recipe and you sort of stuck with it all the way through? I'd be interested to know what you what your answer to that question is, Neil, as well. I, I don't have much of a recipe, and if anybody ever invites me to give a talk on something like science communication, I don't really know what to say. I mean, I just do it. I suppose what one of the things that I do is to put myself in the position of the reader. I mean, that's an obvious thing. How could anyone not do that? And yet many people don't actually. Um, you have to imagine yourself in the position of the reader who would, or the listener, who would wonder, what's he getting at there? What's happening there? I don't, I don't get that point. Please elaborate on that point. 
So I tend to imagine an imaginary reader looking over my shoulder and it can be a particular person. It could be a person that, um, oh, perhaps wrote me a letter that day. And so I've got him or her in my mind. And so I imagine how, what, it'd be, what would it be like for her reading this? What would it be like for him reading this? I don't know whether you do anything like that. I, oh, I do that. You probably it, do. It, it, yeah, th of course, all the time. But I add another aspect to it, I think. And again, with varying success, most people don't read. So for me, I always ask myself, is there something I can add to this that will attract someone who doesn't have walls of books behind them, you know, in, in their bedroom or in their den? And so that involves some sensitivity to just people in the street. And so I'm wondering for you, um, how, what is the difference to you between the written word and the spoken word or the written word and the conversation you're having someone who's just curious in the street? You, you, yes. you can't just tell them, read my 400 no, page book. No, Does, that doesn't work. Um, and, and actually, you're reminding me, Neil, of, of, of one of the, our first encounters when you took me to task. I think it might have been in San Diego or, or maybe Seattle or something like that. Um, and you said that maybe you said something like it's got to be an act of seduction, an act of persuasion, um, as opposed to here's my book, take it or leave it. And you've just, as it were, reiterated that point. It's a very good point. Um, I certainly try to do that, obviously to try to do that when I'm talking face to face with somebody. I mean, you, you, you read the body language, you read the facial language, you, you see, is it going in? Are they, are they getting it? Are they shaking their head with doubt? Um, are they looking in the sort of blank incomprehension? Um, so that's easy when you're face to face with somebody. When you're faced with a large audience, which is a mixed audience, you don't quite know, you, you can't tell how people are reacting. And of course, with a book, it's even worse because you can't even see their eyes as they're reading. Um, I suppose I try to take account of all those things when I'm writing, um, but it's not easy. Well, let me tell you, let me remind you what I precisely what I took you to task about. And just to, to sharpen that memory, it was 2006. It was a conference, one of, one of the early conferences that landed on YouTube. And so it got a lot of awareness uh, received a lot of attention at the time. Today, it might get lost in sort of the noise of what's been posted. But 2006, and they finally got all the talks together by 2007. So it was early clickable internet content. Um, and it had a, a mixture of scientists and a couple of theologians, if I remember correctly, skeptics. And it was just, it was called Beyond Belief. You know, what? where do we go if belief is not going to be the centerpiece here? All I told you at the table, which was the very first day I had met you, by the way, and I was very nervous because <laughs> you're one of you're one of my heroes of. of well, I was nervous too <laughs> of science and communication. <laughs> and what I what I I had seen you give a talk at this very same conference. I said, Damn, this guy is sharp, and the wit is just barbed and it's like and he knows he's right and the, he knows who, who he's talking to is wrong and it was just it was so precise and so there was no room to have a person just say can you let me just I, I don't know recover for a moment <laughs> and, and so I worried that your messaging was missing people because of how articulately barbed it was, that it might've actually turned people off. And then I, I said, perhaps you can go at this with a, a, with a, a more of a subtle art of persuasion, rather than just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, you all idiots, read my book, you'll be fine for it. See, so that was, that's what I came at you. And it's that, all coming back to me very vividly now, and, and, <laughs> and I, I was I was very um, I, was, I was moved by it actually. And what I said at the time, I think, was I gratefully accept the rebuke, uh, and and I did. Um, I, yes, I you mean, did. It, and you were very gracious about it. And, and by the way, no one back then knew me from Adam, but they all knew you. And when I said this, 
it was basically an attack. And there was this eerie silence in the room <laughs> after I had spoken. And and when you said, I gratefully accept your rebuke, it was like, oh. <laughs> I think and people it got wondered a, there was going to be fisticuffs. I didn't know. It, it, it got a great laugh, not least from you. I mean, I, I, I recall, I can actually hear it again. Your your wonderful laugh as I said that, um, and I hope I've learned from that. I, I don't know whether I have. Uh, I wonder whether you agree with me that sometimes, um, if you make a great effort to be clear, as we both do, it can come across as a bit aggressive. Sometimes people like to hear a bit of flanneling around, a bit of a bit of woolly talk. And if you if you make a real effort to talk clearly, they think it's somehow too in your face. Yeah. So that's there is what you think it is, and there's how it's received, right? And as you can be a, an educator who faces the chalkboard and puts the notes on the board and not really paying attention, or you can try to meet the people not just halfway, but maybe 90% of the way to their own space of thinking. And yeah, by the way, this, uh, we'll talk more about this a little later, but my primary, the primary value of social media to me, apart from what it is to wade through the cesspool that it is, is I get to see how people are thinking based on what words I chose, what phrase I composed, what idea I put on the page. And I can say, oh, you're all wrong or you misinterpreted me. No, this is a real, this is a real experiment in progress. If they misinterpreted you, if they didn't understand the word, how you used it, if, if that happened, that actually happened. It is real. So, so I, I've used social media as my source of awareness of how people think, what they think, and what I might want to do if I want to be more effective. That's interesting. I mean, I, I find your your tweets, which I look at from time to time, uh, very interesting because you tend to be, I, I think you think of yourself as an educator, which you are, and, and you tend to um, give little snippets of in, interesting, fascinating science in a witty kind of way. And uh, so you're a res it seems to me that what you're doing is arousing people's excitement for science by what you tweet. And I wouldn't, I hadn't realized that you were actually looking out for how, how people respond to that. That's interesting. Yeah, that's my, that's my, so in a way, it, think of it as a sort of a neurosynaptic snapshot of how people are thinking about what you're saying. So that next time you're in front of an, a large audience in an auditorium, let's say, you now have a a portfolio of the, at least a statistical portfolio of how people are thinking and what they're thinking and why and what they're, um, uh, and, and how they're reacting more importantly. So that's, that's kind of how I, how I think about it. 